Welcome in Rose City to Soccer Made in Portland. I'm Ryan Clark, joined by the Italian Stallion. Definitely not Chris Italian. Reifer. I, I just went there once. <laughs> Chris Reifer, back from Italy <laughs> to, to share with us uh, his, his travels, his, his insights into the, to the greater human condition after returning from Europe. I, I'm pleased to say that I, I spent uh, about two and a half weeks studying abroad. Uh, this summer and now I'm really into soccer. So that 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 if it, if there were any questions out there about my soccer bona fides, uh, I was in the same city as several t- soccer teams you may have heard of before, uh, including Ajax. I was in Amsterdam unintentionally, albeit uh, for about a day. Uh, I, Fiorentina, if you like them, I was in Florence. Uh, you know, if you were really wanted to get into, into some deep cuts, I'm sure there's like a second division team in Siena. I actually walked by their stadium. Uh, I was in, I was there for about three hours. Um, uh, so yeah, obviously I, I like soccer a lot and, and know a lot about it now. Gio Savarese's favorite city, Florence, Italy. I, and he, he, for good he reason. loves Firenze. Yeah. It's a beautiful place for good reason. Uh, it, it, it is a, be- I, I was also in Venice. So Venezia, like a really like American soccer hipster vibes, uh, with that as well. Saw multiple people walking around in, uh, Venezia kits did not ask them if they know Tanner Tessman. Um, uh, and uh and and yeah so you know it, it was great stuff uh saw a lot of great things spent the first week or so running up in the in the dolomites um uh, doing some trail running up there which was like otherworldly uh it was insane uh and then and then traveled around and you know ate, ate things and drank things and 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 you know went to museums i will say in terms of things that were better than expected uh go see the david in Florence. I'm not like a, a, a big art person and I, I don't know a lot about it. So it's not particularly acceptable to me. Like I appreciate it, but it's, uh, I'm relatively superficial in terms of the way I appreciate art uh, in particular. But, but so like, you know, I'll, I'll see famous pieces of art and I'll be like, Oh, that's cool. Uh, the David something else. It's wild. So go see it. Uh, if you had, that's my advice. If you have the opportunity at any point in your life, it's it's crazy. Well, welcome back to the country where people are trying to get photos of the David banned from schools uh, because they don't think it's appropriate. <laughs> yeah, well, you know, I mean, it is uh, it, 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 it is a problem. If you have a problem with the human form, <laughs> that is challenging because it is a, a, a really remarkable and accurate depiction of the human form. So. I, I I guess I I get that now. I mean, it, you know, it 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 really was the the thing that probably exceeded my expectations the most. I got like you got to get tickets to go in advance, so you got to like sort sort all that stuff out. But I was yeah. kind of like, all right, I'll go see that. And you see a number of other sculptures in in Florence because of the aforementioned qualities of the city. It's beautiful. There's lots of that kind of stuff, and that's all like impressive and and sort of gave me the oh yeah cool. Uh, kind of stuff, and then you go see the David, and you're like, "Oh, that is something different." Yeah, a sculptor's a sculptor's sculpture. Yeah, is, that's right. is what I would describe the David as. Yeah, this is uh just want to go on the record as this being a pro art podcast. Uh, a pro, pro art, even if I know nothing about it. Yes, exactly. Even if we know nothing about it combined, uh, this is a pro art podcast. We both now have seen the David, so that's that's uh. That's a cool thing that we can now share. Only people uh, along who have with... seen the David on this podcast today. Yes, that is correct. Exclusive club. We had some other we had some other possibilities, but we just cut him because I don't know if Ned has seen the David. I'll have to ask him. He was on last yeah. week. Uh, he was he, good he knows it. how to make pizza, though. Yeah, yeah. He likes he likes making homemade pizza and won't share the recipe with his wife because he wants it to be his his special thing for the kids, which I thought was a funny his thing. Nice, funny detail. Yeah. But uh, ate good, a lot good to that. chat with ate Ned. A lot of pizza. Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> I would imagine you ate plenty of pizza, plenty of pasta. Um, speaking of of the folks that uh, that Ned oversees, the Portland Timbers. Uh, we we talked a little bit last week, Ned and I, about the form that they've been in recently. Uh, a couple of one goal losses to two of the top teams in Mexico, but you know, despite those results, I think showcasing much better form uh, and and quality over those last uh, couple games and really the, the games before that as well. Uh, you think about the Columbus game where they, they won to honor Diego Valeri. That was a very strong performance. Uh, and now they're, they're at a point in their season where they have 11 games left. 
They are in 12th in the West, but only, you know, three points outside of the playoff picture. A lot of work to do to, to get back into the, to the top nine uh, and get into the MLS Cup playoffs. First chance to do that is against the ninth place team. That's on Sunday at 5.30 p.m. Pacific against Houston on the road. Um, big one against the Dynamo right out of the gate. Timbers are going to be missing a few guys. Um, you know, Diego Chara is suspended due to yellow card accumulation, which I had completely forgotten about until I got to training this week. I mean, week. the last league game was like a month ago, so you're forgiven yeah. for that, I think. Yeah, I've, I've been zoned out on uh, on what had been happening a month ago. But uh, they will also not have Santiago Moreno, who had a, another ankle injury. And uh, we'll talk a little bit more about the, the off-field interest in uh, in Santi as that, that issue ongoing continues saga. to seem, yeah, seem to be ongoing there. Um you know, no Zach McGraw in all likelihood. He's been sick uh, and has been getting checked out by doctors the last couple of days. Um, you know, that medical information, we'll, we'll, we'll wait and see as soon as we get more of that. But, um, you know, hoping Zach is is doing OK. Obviously, he, he uh, is an important player for this team. So they'll be looking to potentially fill him in with Miguel Araujo. We got new faces coming in as well. Brian Acosta um, probably going to start in Diego Chara's place. Uh, Anthony's going to join the team in Houston, but not play, uh, in all likelihood on Sunday. So, so a lot of, a lot of storylines, a lot of interesting layers to, to where the Timbers are at. They've dug themselves into a bit of a hole and, and now is, is the time to either climb out or stay put. And Gio talked this week about the importance of having that intensity and, and maintaining the form that they had in leagues cup, uh, against, two very good teams uh in in Monterey and Tigres so we'll see what 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 are your expectations for for this home stretch and and what I guess are, are some of the things that you're you know keeping an eye on you know as I look at the rest of the season 11 games remaining in the league uh which really is the Timbers sort of last opportunity to salvage anything from 2023 whatever year this is, 2023, uh, a, you know, early U S open cup exit, no CONCACAF champions league, early exit from the league's cup. This is, this is kind of it now. Right. And I, as I look at these last 11 games, I kind of break them into three chunks. So the first is this upcoming three game stretch, uh, at Houston, uh, uh, Vancouver home, RSL home. I think I got the sequencing right there, but like 50, 50, who knows? Uh, and then they've got, Three bit more complicated games. There's a game uh, at Seattle. There's LAFC and then one more in that stretch. And then they've got sort of a five game stretch to finish the season. That's pretty accessible. Uh, and that has a number of pretty winnable games in it. Uh, I think when you look at sort of that breakdown uh, of games, the I think it's hard to sort of plot out any likely scenario in which the Timbers you know, get up to any respectable place in the table without taking probably at least seven points from this first window. Uh, I think they've got to win the two home games against Vancouver and RSL. I think that's basically indispensable. And I think they need to not lose at Houston because giving the Dynamo three points in that game would be very bad given what you just mentioned that they are sort of, they are the <laughs> the red line right now. Uh, if the Timbers find themselves, you know, five or six points behind the red line after this weekend, they're looking at a mountain to climb. It's just hard to make that up, especially when you've got another team in Minnesota who's currently below the red line, who's playing pretty well. So it's not just a matter of jumping one team. They've got to jump a couple teams uh, if they want to get to the point where they're just even in the playoffs, which as we've discussed by itself, ain't shoot, right? If, if they finish ninth this year, get bounced in, you know, a playing game or the first round, I mean, nobody cares. <laughs> like, like, you know, like that's not that's not an accomplishment. Uh, there would definitely be questions still about whether Gio Savarese would keep his job. There would, you know, be increasing heat on Ned Grabovoy. I mean, th- th- all of those things would still happen if that were the case. And so, this isn't just a matter. And I don't think we should be framing the issue as just, you know, are they going to be able to sneak above the red line? Because that's not the question, uh, and that would not you know, make this season a success by any means whatsoever. They finished eighth last year. Uh, nobody yeah. thought that was a success. Uh, no. <laughs> and, uh, and, and similarly, if they did that again this year, I don't think anybody would think that's a success either. And so I think in this first stretch, they've got to take 
something like seven points from these three games, which is an immense challenge. I, I, I agree that this last stretch has probably been pretty close to the high watermark of the Timbers form over the course of the season. I think that frankly, that says more about how the season has gone as a whole than it does really about the Timbers current form. Uh, you know, I think that the, you know, we discussed, I, I think already the, the game is against Columbus definitely had some really good stretches in it, especially about the last 20 minutes or half hour of that game were, were quite good. Uh, but that was a pretty up and down performance. There were some rough stretches in that game, especially through the middle as well. Uh, and they got the win in that game and against a Columbus team that was without its best player in Cucho Hernandez. Uh, and, and that's a win that you would hope the Timbers would get. And, and they did. So credit to them uh, and credit to them for the, for the good, uh, for the good stretches of play that they had in that game. And then they knocked off San Jose at home. Which, again, San Jose is very much sort of in this sort of pack of middling teams in the West. They've kind of come off the early season heater a little bit uh, and have been about more what we expected San Jose to be over the course of the last month or so. And the Timbers handled them pretty easily at home. Again, that's about what you would expect. I mean, if, if you can't beat San Jose at home, forget about it, <laughs> right? I mean, that, that, is, that is a minimum requirement to be able to win a game like that at home. And they did. So credit to them. And then, you know, I, I think it is definitely true that the games against Tigres and Monterrey were better in terms of were, were, you know, good performances in many respects in terms of the way they played. Uh, I think there is and should be a decent amount of criticism of Evander for his performance against Tigres. It was after he scored a phenomenal opening goal, a really immature performance from from a guy who the Timbers have put a lot of stock in, both financially and otherwise, uh, to help carry the team. It was a really immature performance from him to be, uh, both to give away the ball in a really bad spot, uh, to set up the sequence that, on, on which Tigres capitalized. Those are the kinds of mistakes you can't make in big games like that. And then to get sent off with two yellows uh, in the first half, uh, including one that I, I think is, is both fairly described as soft and pretty dumb. Uh, and, and that's, you can't do that. And, and that very much sort yeah. of, yeah, two things can be true about that, that yeah. play one wrong call two yep. dumb wrong dis- decision and, and a, a really not a smart play by Evander in, to, in, to put in, himself in that situation inviting the, and that has happened before with him, right? He, he had the situation where he reached back and, and slapped a guy in the face pretty intentionally and got suspended and earlier relatively in the year. recently. I mean, yeah. and, and it's just those kinds of things that if you're going to be in the position that Evander is in, in the team can't do that stuff. I mean, you're hurting the team. Yeah. I, it, it takes an awful lot of mind blowing free kicks to make up for that stuff. And in that yeah, game, he's his so mind blowing free kick did. No, it didn't. And, and, that leads into my point that like he's he's so important to what they do. You know, there there are people that rightfully have have you know criticized certain stretches of his his play this year, you know, moments where in in their opinion, this is not my opinion, but in in the opinion of some fans and watchers and critics, like he he has looked unmotivated in stretches. He has looked like he has has not um you know desired to to maybe live up to the to the to the contract, to the you know, transfer fee, but then there's moments of brilliance. Right. And so, so this sort of up and down feeling of, of his first season has, has been interesting as a narrative and he doesn't obviously do himself any favors with that crowd. If uh, you know, he's, he's got issues like this popping up. He's, he's not somebody that, you know, when you talk to him and when you're around him, that is in any way like a hothead or somebody like with a short temper who, who gets bothered easily, but now, like in his very first season in MLS, he's he's sort of reacted in this way multiple times and and hurt hurt the team, and it's unfortunate. And you know, it's not obviously all on Evander that those results happened, you no. know. But 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 it doesn't help, especially given how significant he is to to how they produce on the attack. And you know, I think he's he's motivated in this last stretch of the season to now that he really does feel integrated with this group and, and feels like he is the, the star player that, that, you know, he wants to be. Um, and they've got the, the people around him mostly healthy to, to, and productive. Let's be honest, like Frank Bully and, and Felipe Mora have both been 
pretty strong in recent weeks. Um, you know, Jimmy Char is back and, and, you know, still figuring his stuff out, but you know, he's healthy and that's a, that's a body that is valuable. Dyron Esprit is a guy that has had, had great stretches this year. So, so those guys around him, um, have, have started to work well with him, particularly Bowley, I think. Um, and that's great for his confidence and it's great for the Timbers because when, when Evander's clicking, when he's making plays to those guys, when he's, you know, a, a monster on set pieces and, and is, is a guy that you can rely on in those scenarios. Um, this is a, a good Timbers team, but when that is not the case or when there are other aspects of this team, which we've talked about ad nauseum that, you know, sort of drag that down, whether it's it's the inconsistency in, in defending um, that they have experienced in stretches or, um, you know, just the the inability to finish was a big thing against Monterey uh, and that rearing its head in, in these games against lesser teams, in their view, lesser teams um, or teams in their category, maybe a better way to put it since lesser is, is pretty hard to find when you're third from last in the West, but in those games, like you're going to, you're going to drop points if you keep doing those, those things and falling into those habits that you've had throughout the season. And they're, they are in no position to, to continue to drop points anymore. They've dropped all the points they can basically possibly drop. And, and probably a point. few extra too. <laughs> and a few more. Yeah. And geo geo is pretty upset about that. No secret. <laughs> and he, he wants, you know, not only for his, for his own sake, that's probably not front of mind for him, but I'm sure it is. It's, it's part I, I mean, of the equation. Look, yeah, of course it's front of it. It's top of mind for him and, and it's top of mind for a number of players too, right? I mean, there yeah. are a lot of people in the team right now who are playing and or coaching for their jobs. Yeah. And there's going to be a lot of movement this off season, regardless of how the Timbers finish this, this year in, in my understanding. And, you know, there's there's certain guys who who the club is probably on the fence about, you know, people who are who have, you know, spent some time here and, and maybe not worn out their welcome because that's that's a bit harsh. But they well, they are in a, in a position they're welcome. <laughs> <laughs> they, they're in a position where the, the next step in their career can either be here or not. And that's not the case for everybody. There's guys that are that are pretty solidly going to be here next year. And, and I think uh, but, Evander is one yeah. of those guys. Yeah. But I also think that who, who, to be clear, one of those guys who will be here next year, but you know, you talked about how this is, you know, uh, he's motivated for this final stretch. This is an important stretch for him too. Uh, I don't know if I would go quite as far as you did in calling the Timbers a good team when Evander is, is firing on all cylinders. I, I think they've got some other deficiencies that maybe would make me hesitate before I'd call them good, but they're certainly better. Right. And there's no real way for this Timbers team to be a good team that doesn't include Evander being at his peak performance level, among a few other things that need to fall into place. So I, I think he is an, an indispensable element of this Timbers team being being a good team. And I think. You know, I, I one of the things that, that Ned said in your interview with him last week, if it was last week, when you're on vacation, time just sort of turns into a relative thing. But last week, uh, in, in, when, you, when you talk to Ned, and I think he's spot on about this, is that it's been a consistent thread over the course of the season that the Timbers have not done a good enough job of not just finishing chances, but really creating good chances. And, and having that ability in the final third to translate a good sequence of buildup into an actual goal scoring chance. Well, that's a lot of what Evander was brought in to do, right? <laughs> I mean, when they paid $10 million for that guy, that the, a big part of the thought was that he's going to be the guy who takes those good sequences of buildup and turns them into dangerous chances, whether he's scoring the goal himself uh, or, or or unlocking the final ball and doing that kind of thing. And here we are. He's 1,500 minutes into his season. We're in late August. He's got five goals and three assists. Not terrible, especially when you consider that there's an acclimation period, and that's to be expected. And I think people have rightly been generally pretty patient with him uh, about that. But also unambiguously a disappointment, right? The Timbers were certainly hoping for more. 
from him to this point in the season. And when you add to that these these moments where he's sort of let the team down with you know the kind of stuff that we saw against Tigres the bad t- the bad turnovers the uh the 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 moments of indiscipline uh or that we saw at the end of June uh in getting suspended I mean that that all s- sort of piles on and he'll be back for 2024 because the Timbers have made a too big of, a, of an investment to consider cutting bait at this point but it's got to be a lot better from him and uh and and I you know if it's not I think that's that that probably would be a fatal blow uh for the Timbers as they as they finish out the MLS campaign so you know I mean this is this is sort of an offshoot of a broader conversation about the the last stretch of games I I agree that it's been maybe their best stretch of play over the course of the season um but i think there's also a little bit of danger of becoming moral victory fc right uh because i mean in the end they they got two home wins that they probably should have gotten uh given the opponent and the fact that those games were at home and then they lost two games also at home uh albeit to two liga mx gigantes right i mean tigres and and realos are are huge teams oh and they beat some good MLS teams over the course of uh, of the tournament, and and so I'm not here to say that those are terrible losses. But if at the end of the season, you know, one of the highlights is, hey, we didn't get totally pumped by Monterrey, <laughs> it's not great. <laughs> and so uh, they need to go from being moral victory FC, which I think has been a little bit of the the atmosphere and environment over the course of the last couple of weeks, to like actual victory FC. And they need to do that immediately because uh, if they don't, then then at the end of the season they're gonna you know when 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 we're we're hitting the highlights uh, on uh, on their sort of report card for the season. One of the things is yeah, well we didn't totally get our butts kicked by Monteday. And if that's making your highlight list, <laughs> uh, that says an awful lot. Yeah, they want more, and they they are gonna need more in the coming weeks you, you look at these these upcoming matches obviously sunday 5 30 against houston on the road then those aforementioned two home games uh on the 26th and the 30th against vancouver and rsl um those you can categorize as as a must win or a can't lose or, or however you want well can't lose would be what you're can't describing lose is the, houston the houston game, game. a must yeah. win is the vancouver and rsl game Exactly. Uh, and then September is not easy. It is, is much harder than those two home games. You got Seattle on the road, LAFC at home. Um, LAFC is obviously a team that wants to get into strong form down the stretch because they want to contend for an MLS cup. You know, everybody obviously wants to be in good form down the stretch, but there's extra motivation for a team that, that, uh, you know, wants, wants a cup, um, on the road at Austin, uh, and then, uh, hosting San Jose, Colorado, and then on the road at, at, at LA Galaxy to finish September. Last two games of the year, on the road at Montreal, and then decision day, 21st of October, at home against the Dynamo again. So that's it. That's all that's left. And they are going to need to play some seriously much better soccer than they have through the first 23 games. In and get the results. 11. Yeah, and get the results, not just play well, not just proud of our guys, not just, you know, fought hard, fought hard. They need to be actual you know. victory. FC. Yeah. Yeah. Actual three points, actual results in order to climb the table. There is more leeway this year than there has ever been in a normal season. The Timbers would not be in a position right now where we're there three points out of the of the playoff picture. They would. Under old rules be five points out of the seventh spot, which was originally the, the last playoff spot up till this year. But now there are nine teams. And if you get in as the nine, cool, but you got to then beat the eight in the plan. And then right now they would face St. Louis, which I think is if you're in good form, not the worst place to be. <laughs> if you're the eight seed, you'd rather probably play them than LAFC. Uh, On talent. If, if, yeah. If you want to talk Talent about and, you know, and experience, 
Yeah, talent and experience. There's a lot of rumblings about is St. Louis like a, a pretender rather than a contender. There's a lot of teams that have had great regular seasons in MLS that have, have stunk it up in the playoffs because it's just a different beast. And and not to um, throw throw cold water on St. Louis, I also think just stylistically, they're the kind of team that it can do well in regular seasons and then tends to struggle in the, in the playoffs because they like to press so much. I mean that they really are set up to exploit teams that want to go out and dominate a game. And nobody tries to do that in the playoffs. Like the, the, the playoffs tend to be much more conservative, uh, much more counterattacking oriented. And that is, I mean, as we saw from the Timbers, when they went to St. Louis and beat them, you can beat St. Louis that way. Uh, and so yeah. I, I agree. I also have a hunch that St. Louis is not going to be the one seed by the end of the year. Uh, I, I think as these games get tighter and as they get more playoff like, uh, I think there's a good chance that they will be overtaken. Very tight table in, in its different phases, right? The top fours is pretty tight with St. Louis, LAFC, RSL, and, and Seattle as the top four. RSL. RSL's playing real well. Yeah. Third, I mean, third place. so, so we, you know, we've been talking about, uh, that game being a must win. And I think it is, it's not an easy win. Uh, it's not one that you would say the Timbers, uh, are probably even favored and given how well RSL has been playing. Uh, yeah. This is but not it's your nonetheless brother's one that, RSL team. That's right. That's right. Uh, it's nonetheless one that they're going to need. Yeah. And you know, the, the next part of the table, I guess the bottom half of the playoff picture being Austin, San Jose, Vancouver, Dallas, Dynamo, kind of a mess, Minnesota, to be honest, KC. Yeah. I mean, it's Minnesota's it's probably six, the team six of that points group. separating Portland from the fifth spot. And that's a lot of teams in there. Yeah. So. Uh, of that group, Minnesota's probably playing the best uh, right now with Babelo Reynoso back in fitness and form. Uh, and, and, you know, I mean, we'll see exactly how it shakes out. It, I mean, it, it sort of exposes both the peril uh, of the Timbers' current position. It would not take a whole lot for that group really to get away from them. A couple bad results. I mean, they lose at, at Houston, then they drop one of those two, say, against Vancouver and RSL. And you could very much see them being well below, well underwater, even as compared to the minimum competency level standard of the red line this year. Um, but it also shows the opportunity, right? If they go on a run they could get themselves into a place where they nonetheless have an opportunity to capture a respectable seed in the playoffs and have a, a real opportunity to compete. I don't think that nine seed in the long term gives you a real opportunity to compete. Uh, I, I think I, I think probably the it eight creates seed an also extra doesn't. step. It, it creates an extra step. And, and additionally, like you're going to you're going to face a better team. Duh. Like you're going to be lower in the standings and you're going to face a team that's near the top of the team. And you're going to have to play them twice yeah. on the road. Uh, so you, and typically when you go on the road to face a team that's better than, than, than you, it's going to be a challenge. Oh, uh, and so, you know, uh, but, but it shows the opportunity, right? Because if the Timbers go on a run and maybe have a couple of results uh, elsewhere in, in, on the schedule fall their way, they could get to a decent seed in which, from which they can compete. Uh, you don't need to be the one seed to compete. We've seen that in the past, but you do need to be a solid one. Uh, you, you, you can't expect to be coming into the playoffs as a nine and be able to do something. And unless you have Lionel Messi, unless you have Leo Messi and the transfer <laughs> window is closed. So Neymar is not walking through that door. Uh, 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 <laughs> I, I, I guess Mbappe is also on the market. Mbappe is not walking through that door. Uh, so yeah, I mean, I, I think they, they got who they got. Uh, and this team is not going to win MLS cup from the nine seed. I'll, I'll, there's my hot take. Uh, yeah. Very <laughs> hot take. Um, so yeah, that's, that's the w one final subject I wanted to, to touch on. We don't need to obviously discuss it, but Lionel Messi said he would play on turf if he was in that position. I think, I think there's a lot of layers to that. Namely, there's a whole lot of money involved in the fact that everywhere he goes, it's sold out and the tickets are insanely expensive and it's a, major draw for the league and it's a lot of factors there that would lead leo to to play on turf don't think he's done it since he was an academy kid if i if i'm thinking of correctly although he's played many many matches since then but if your portland timbers make it to mls cup and uh have a better record than uh than inter miami 
there's your chance to see him this year. I don't know if it's going to happen next year. I don't know how the MLS schedule makers are going to to iron things out, whether Portland would travel down there, vice versa, or if at all, since they're in the East. But I would be messy. shocked if the algorithm finds a way to minimize the number of of turf games that that uh, that Miami have next year. And so it wouldn't. Yeah. You know, it, if we if we get to next spring and Inter Miami is not slated for a trip to Portland, I. I will not have to sit down out of surprise. I'll put it that way. <laughs> yeah, they'll they'll definitely go to Atlanta, but I don't yeah. know about come some are unavoidable, but they'll have to go to New England. But the, you know, it wouldn't surprise me if they're they're not going to come to Portland. And we'll see with that kind of stuff. I also think we probably need to mention the Santiago Moreno saga. Yes, uh, Santi uh, went on uh, on sort of Spanish language media down in South America, uh, and and essentially made some comments that he would like to make. A move similar to what we've heard in the past. Uh, the two teams that are mentioned now are, are Boca Juniors from uh, from the, the Argentine Gigantes uh, and much less than Gigantes <laughs> out of Argentina. Talleres uh, is, is, is the second one. Uh, the interest from Boca seems to have been at this point fairly superficial. Uh, it sounds like there hasn't been any formal offer from Boca uh, and that is not surprising. Frankly, I mean, I, I would be surprised if Boca was, was putting on the full court press to get Santiago Moreno in light of his MLS form. Uh, Talleres makes a little bit more sense, but it's not exactly also a destination that is, you know, it ain't Liverpool, right? Uh, this isn't the, the, the fabled, uh, in terms of, uh, Timbers experience move to Europe, uh, that, uh, that they talk about a lot, but haven't really pulled off yet. Uh, and, and and so this this is sort of a continuation of a saga that I think in in it's fair to say in in the Timbers' hopes and in the way that they'd been communicating publicly about it, they'd hoped and and thought was put to bed. Clearly, it's not. Uh, what did did I did I get all that right? Uh, did I summarize it right? Uh, anything else to add, sort of on 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 what's been going on with Santi? Yeah. Look, what he's saying and doing is, is flying in the face of of that press conference that they had him do where he he came out with with a pretty glum look on his face and said you know those words never came out of my mouth i never said that i didn't want to be here you know my family has been helping me through this it's been a difficult time um you know all, the the family aspect is true you know his his he spoke on that Colombian radio station about the fact that his mom has actually come up here to live with him. And and that's, you know, not to manage some fake story that's been bandied about in the media by a rogue agent or somebody else. It's because he's unhappy. He said repeatedly that he's unhappy, not only, you know, playing for the Timbers, but just with everything that's going on right now and the contract situation is at the front of that for sure this no is question. very cl clearly and obviously a contract dispute but the layers to it are one that he is unhappy unquestionably despite you know what some of the narratives have been on that front and two he's in terrible form and has been hurt all year and hasn't scored a goal yet like he has not scored <laughs> all season and for a guy that, you know, coming into the year, there was a lot of excitement about, you know, they talked about that fabled move to Europe thing that you, that you were saying with him, you know, Gio publicly was saying that, that he's a guy that could make that jump. Um, you know, and being hurt doesn't help, but he's also just been in bad form and unmotivated and it all ties together, man. Like he's him, his being unhappy, his not getting the contract that he thinks he deserves based on last season's performance and based on comparable productivity levels. Uh, at his position compared to other players last season, not this season um, has, has led to this issue. You know, there's, there's um, you know, he talked about lack of performance bonuses in his contract. We don't know obviously the details, but stuff like that um, is in his view, poorly negotiated. And the, the rift is there. Look, it's, it's not this imaginary thing that I made up, that I heard from untrustworthy people and put into a story just because I thought it'd be fun to put out there. This is a real situation. And surprise, at the surprise. end of the day, yes, at the end of the day, like 
Santi is going to continue playing for the team through the end of this year. He's got a camp for kids that he's doing with Zach McGraw in late September. Um, that's great. And I'm sure Santi will enjoy that. He, he's a guy that, you know, cares about the the community and, and loves working with kids. He's a father himself. Um, so that'll be good, but I would be pretty surprised if he was in a Timbers uniform come the start of next season, given this rift, unless major concessions are given by the Timbers on the part of his contract and he can get in a better physical and mental space to, to be more productive next year. Cause this year, even if he, you know, finishes relatively strong has been overall very disappointing for him. But here's the thing. Why would the Timbers substantially improve his contract right now? I mean, does that make much sense? Given yeah, yeah, given, from given their what side, you've seen, doesn't. I mean, what, yeah, so <laughs> you know, his you know, he's under contract for multiple years after this. His play has yeah. not been such that you're like, oh, we got to get this guy locked up. Uh, and 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 he clearly has shown on the merits that he deserves to be paid substantially more. Uh, and that's, I mean, that's sort of why this situation has just become a little bit intractable. Because you have a player who's both important, who's important to the team, but has been underperforming and who has been agitating for a move, who is clearly upset not only with his contract, but frankly, I, I think it's impossible to completely dissociate him, this from how he feels about the sporting situation as well. Because frankly, if he was bullish about the sporting situation, and he thought this was a place where he was growing and had the ability to perform well, it would be irrational for him to try to make a move right now because he would be making a move at, when his, his value is that it's Nadir. That's not how you want to do it because he's going to, when you make a move, you sign a new long-term contract with somebody else. And guess what? He's going to get paid a lot less by that somebody else right now than he would if he made a move when he was in good form. And exactly. so, and, and so y- y- you can't sort of just chalk this up as, oh, well, it's just a, it's just the business of sports. Uh, that's not it. It's, it's that they have a, an important player who is kind of in the woods right now. And he's kind of in the woods uh, from an on-field performance perspective, he's in the woods in terms of his relationship with the front office and 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 his satisfaction with with his contract. Uh, and and I think you do have to put that in the full context of of everything that's been going on. It's why it's why I've I've, I've said and I and, and I know the the Timbers don't love this, but it's concerning uh, about about whether there is sort of the the across the board buy in that they need from the team in order to pull off the results that we've been talking about in this last part of the year. I think there's a decent amount of evidence to suggest that maybe there's not, or at at least to raise concerns about that. And I think this is, this is a big part of it. Uh, And so, you know, I, I I would hope uh, that, that, you know, we'll see more from Santi uh, in the last part of the season. That would certainly help uh, in terms of whether he wants to move or get a better contract with the Timbers uh, that would help uh, the, both of those efforts. Uh, but that's an exercise of hope over expectation at this point, uh, because the situation is is increasingly untenable. Shifting gears here to the Portland Thorns. Uh, they are back. Thorns are back. Biggest game uh, of the year coming up. Biggest game of the season. I mean, and I mean maybe yeah. until the next biggest game of the year. And they got a whole bunch of them coming down the stretch. But yeah, biggest game They've of the got- year coming up. Yeah, they got a whole bunch of biggest games, and they probably are not going to lack uh, battles for first place down the stretch, given how tight the table is, given the teams they are going to face. It starts with the North Carolina Courage on Sunday um, at home, 730 Providence Park. Everybody is back from the World Cup with the exception of the U.S. players. Uh, It does not look like Sophia Smith or Crystal Dunn will be available for that match. They've not been training with the team this week. Um, They're taking some much needed R&R after the World Cup, which is obviously a a major um, situation to be in. It's a it's a emotional one, given that they were eliminated earlier than any U.S. team that Vlatko and Novsky resigned that there was so much pressure and criticism leveled on them. Some of it, as I've touched on before, was very unfair from people on Fox like Carly Lloyd and Alexi Lawless and others, but I digress. <laughs> the uh, The Thorns are, are now in a position where they're second in the table, right behind North Carolina. A win on Sunday would catapult the Thorns up above them and put them in, in the top. Uh, top spot. They they want a shield. They want a championship, and they're in a position to be able to do that if 
they can regain their old form. If the world cup players can reintegrate smoothly or as smooth as one can. Um, and, and it's a big test for, for Mike Norris, uh, and, and for the, the players who have been here through the, the world cup stretch, uh, to, to step up and, and get those results because regardless of the shield, you got to get a top two position. If you're the thorns, you don't want to put yourself in a position where you have to go on the road for anything. You want to basically be in the top two in NWSL and do what you did last year, where you got one home game to win. And if you win it, you're in the finals in San Diego and the thorns are the, in my view, most talented team in the NWSL. And when in form are, are a force, they're one of the best teams in the world, but There have been, as we have touched on on this podcast extensively, concerning stretches of this season, questions about tactics and and form and at times, you know, motivation, but less so than those other two points. There's motivation now for everybody there to, to finish this stretch strong. There's only seven games left, including Sunday, which is crazy to think about. Um, You got seven games to essentially set yourself up to play one home game to get into the title game. That that's, that's the, the end of the day. And, and Crystal and Soph should be back next week would be my guess. Um, You know, it's not like they're, you know, out of form or, you know, not, not in shape for, for these games. They've taken time off, but they were grinding in that world cup. And it probably will only take a week or two of, training for them to really get back 90 minutes fit. But, um, you know, them being back is crucial. Crystal and Soph have been two of, if not the two most important players for this team this year. Um, there's, there's a lot of layers to it, but this is a crucial stretch for the thorns regardless. It's a, it's an enormous stretch and their task this weekend is, is a really challenging one. Uh, Carolina has most of their folks back from the world cup. Uh, Caroline is the one potential Dan Lodlata, uh, the excellent Dan Lodlata, uh, reporting that she's had a visa issue that uh, as of a couple days ago, she wasn't back yet, but was expected back this week. Whether she'll be able to play, how much she'll play on the weekend, we'll see. Uh, she's important for Carolina to be sure, but generally they've got their folks back and they're going to be coming to Portland with a full complement of players. Uh, and... I mean, you know, Crystal and, and uh, Dunn and, and, and Smith have been the Thorns' two best players this year. Those are huge losses for the most important game of the season. <laughs> Those are huge absences for, for the most important game of the season. I, I, I don't blame them individually as people uh, by any means. The The World Cup is, is, as you said, both physically very taxing. I mean, you're playing basically every three days uh, in hyper intense games. And so like the physically it's, it, it's very taxing. Uh, emotionally, it's also very taxing even when it goes great. Uh, and that's, that's especially so when it doesn't go great as, uh, I think would be a, a, a generous characterization of the U S world cup. Uh, and, and, and so I, I, I don't begrudge them in the slightest of, of wanting to have an opportunity to take a little bit of a breath before jumping back into what will also be very intense and competitive games to round out the league season, but it's nonetheless a huge loss for the thorns. And honestly, and one of the things that sticks in the back of my mind, uh, because I'm sure the thorns would love to have had both Dunn and Smith back this week. There are some, it seems about half and half U S women's national team players who are back and available for their club teams this weekend. I think that probably would have been a hard sell for the thorns front office to make given that their GM is also still in Australia. (laughs) Um, I don't know how you make that case if you want to broach the subject with Dunn and Smith, given the importance of the games uh, when when, uh, your GM is also going to be in Australia covering uh, covering the the, the final for Fox. Uh, That is a little bit of a point of concern. Uh, And look, given the the stakes of these games heading toward the end of the season, that could end up being a storyline. Nonetheless, it seems they won't be available and, and, you know, the thorns are going to have to, to go into this critical game, uh, with the players who that they have, uh, it's going to be a challenging one, uh, to be sure. Christine Sinclair is back. Rocky Rodriguez is back. Uh, and, uh, and, you know, they're going to be, uh, in the team and, and, and figure to play prominent roles, 
Um, but you know, North Carolina is a very good team and, uh, and the thorns are going to, are going to have to find a way without their two best players. One potential good bit of news, uh, is that it seems at least possible that Becky Sauerbrunn is going to be back as well, uh, for the thorns, uh, you know, given some of the defensive frailties that we've seen over the course of the year, that is beneficial. Um, uh, but goodness, you know, I mean, this is, this is probably a can't lose game for the thorns uh and and shorthanded against a really good carolina team that means they're gonna have to put in a really good performance uh in order in order to get the result they need if they win they're gonna be top of the table if i am doing my math right uh they will be top of the table uh you know even if they draw they're still gonna be in that conversation um they have a lot of games in this run-in against teams in the top half of the table that is very congested uh and so which is good news and bad news, right? The bad news is schedule's really complicated. There aren't a lot of easy points out there, but the good news is the Thorns control their destiny. Go out and win their games uh, and get good results, and they're not going to have to worry about anybody else because they're going to get the points they need, and they're going to deny the important teams the points they need uh, in order to to get one of those top two spots. Uh, But they're going to need everybody to be fully engaged, uh, fully healthy, uh, and they need that sooner rather than later. Yeah, there's got to be buy-in from everybody. Look, I, I I think that there's no doubt in my mind that this group of, of veteran players and and young talented players are are bought in and and desire to to win another championship. They desire to, um, you know, get a shield and a title in the same year, which the Thorns have not done. Um, they they want to make their mark. Um, but but yeah, there's I mean there's there's uncertainty this season. And and a question that we received from from a listener online uh, a, a couple of days ago, it may not have been to, to the Soccer Maiden PDX tweet, but um, something that that I've been thinking about is that yeah, there are, there are contracts expiring at the end of this year. There are contract extensions that uh, that need to be you know completed. Need to and, get done immediately. Yeah, Sophia <laughs> like, Smith like now <laughs> is is number one on that list. Like just just back up the Brinks truck for Sophia. That is a no brainer. She's on the road to being a, an NWSL MVP again this year, and you know those are important things. Speaking to Sophia, look, she's she's got ten goals, five assists. In my mind, at this point, everything being frozen right now in NWSL, uh, she's the MVP. And if they finish the season strong, um, top two seed, you know, she continues her form. No doubt in my mind that she's going to bring that award home again. I'd, I'd be shocked unless somebody else goes on an absolute tear and is just like convincingly better than she's been and is going to be. I don't see it. I think there's extra motivation there for her too. that early World Cup exit. Um, she she if she didn't already have a gigantic chip on her shoulder, she, she walks around with one, but the, the, there's another chip or the chip got bigger with, with what happened there. And, and she's a very motivated high level competitor. And um, she's the type of person that can carry it to, to that. So I'm excited to see her back on the field for the thorns. It's also going to be great to, to see others reintegrated like Hina Sugita, like Rocky Rodriguez, um, Christine Sinclair, back now as well after obviously a disappointing exit for Canada in the, in the uh, group stage. Um, what, what, Crystal, is Sugi, what is Sugita's status for the upcoming weekend? I don't think we've hit that just yet. We have not. She will not be available on Sunday is, is my understanding. She hasn't been training with the team, has not been back uh, with the team quite yet. Obviously, Japan made it made a solid run, but um, came up short of, of what people, I think, expected. I was one of them. I was like, oh, on a limb, I, I, when Bill Oram was on this podcast, I was like, Japan's going to win the World Cup. And Bill <laughs> talked about something like his kid, uh, you know, also made that pick. Me and Bill's kid were wrong, unfortunately. The, the, the quarterfinals struck me as, as not like in the grand scheme, not altogether surprising for, for Japan to go out. Uh, I definitely had some doubt. I mean, just on talent, that's sort of about where I expected expected them to go. Uh, they looked. I mean, they've looked good for a while now. They are one of the best teams in the world to watch. Uh, you, when we saw them against the U.S. Women's National Team, what was that a year ago or so now? They looked really good, uh, and they have consistently looked really good. And so, uh, it doesn't surprise me that they had some of the the 
best performances of the early stages of the tournament. It also doesn't totally surprise me that when the going got tough, that they were a little bit overmatched. Um, and I think that's basic. That's basically what happened. Uh, yeah. Um, so, you know, I mean, th- th- that's it for the thorns. Th- th- this, uh, the, this upcoming stretch, uh, is going to be enormous. Uh, Cassandra did send us a question, wants to know if there's anybody from the world cup period, uh, for the thorns, uh, who has been a depth piece who you think has made a case for stepping into a larger role? Um, obviously, you know, Moultrie started to get a larger role before the World Cup players left. Yeah, I think, I think that's I been think there. She, she's definitely been there. She she may not have been as effective in, in certain matches as others, but she's she's one of the first that came to mind. The, the number one for me is Hannah Bedford. That's exactly I think that my she, answer. she had a tremendous stretch, uh, three goals, two assists and, and was a force. It sucks that she's, you know, playing the same position as Sophia Smith, but you know, there's creative ways oh, that you can utilize her that, that would allow you to have Bedford and Smith on the field at the same time. I think that Bedford's ability to create and, and Bob and weave, let's say with Morgan Weaver, um, you know, has, has been really impressive. Yeah. That, that was rough. Um, but <laughs> Morgan Weaver and her, you know, had great chemistry on the field, uh, throughout that stretch. And, you know, I, I think that you got to find a way to, to get her in, in games, especially considering Soph is probably not going to run a full 90 right out of the gate. So that, that, that's somebody that has really stepped up and could be a major difference maker in a tight match, uh, down the stretch, uh, in, in these final few games it's it's being, a lot of tough opponents and there's going to be some really competitive matches for her to, to shine being a backup number nine means you're going to play fairly regularly you're not going to get 90 minutes very much you're not going to get 75 minutes very much you're going to get a lot of 10 and 15 minute appearances but you're going to get those pretty regularly if you can establish yourself as a reliable backup number nine uh so i think that's exactly the answer i think it's hannah bedford uh, a player who i will confess i had kind of started to give up on uh and so huge credit to her uh, for persevering through uh, a stretch in which she hadn't played a lot. When she had played, there had been some some pretty down performances through from persevering through that and really seizing this opportunity when she had it uh, in this World Cup period. Overall, I think the Thorns had probably hoped that they would have a couple other players who made that kind of case. Uh, I think Rena Reyes had been building into this sort of position. I think that continued, uh, and I think it, it'll be interesting to see how they use Reyna uh, over the course of uh, of the stretch run, but I expect to see a healthy dose uh, of her. Um, but I, I I think Hannah Bedford for me is 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 the the player who most made a case to to have a bigger role in the team uh, in this the this period going forward. Whether she starts this weekend or not is uh, I think a fair question. The Thorns could go with Christine Sinclair up top. Uh, they could even put Morgan Weaver up there. Although I I think as we've seen that she is better. Uh, on the wing, but they could also go with Bedford given the form. Uh, and, and I think you can make a case for, for, for any of those choices. So we'll see, but good job and, and full credit to Bedford for putting herself in that conversation. She wasn't there before, but she played her way into that conversation and she deserves it. Yeah. During these, these type of international breaks, particularly world cup ones, there, there always seems to be for every team, one or two players who, who, you know, step up and give themselves a, a second look as a player. And, and she's somebody who, you know, when I talked to her about her, her journey as a soccer player, you know, she was a preferred walk on at wake forest. She was somebody who, when she was in high Go school, Deeks. yeah, exactly. <laughs> when she was in high school, um, you know, she was overlooked uh, by recruiters. People were usually there to recruit other people was what she, she joked about. Um, and, and now she got to NWSL and she's, you know, admittedly in sitting behind, you know, superstars, like legends of the game. She's like, yeah, there's like seven or eight like legends on this team. <laughs> like it's, it's pretty hard to find your way in regardless of your position. You know, she's, she's switched positions. She was a defender when she was drafted by Mark Parsons. And now um, at this point in her career, she's, she's a center forward. So um, yeah, it's, it's been a really c- compelling and interesting stick with it type journey for, for Hannah. And I think she's taken full advantage these last few weeks. You know, it's exciting to, to see that, to see her, um, you know, coming into a more prominent role. And and I would bet for sure that, you know, with Izzy Dequilla being a younger player and still developing, um, Betford is that backup number nine. She's somebody yeah. that, um, would, you know, as soon as Soph's ready to come out, um, she's, she's the name that they'll call 
when, when this stretch. Yeah, I, I think Izzy. I, I think I, I neglected to mention her in my in my rant. Izzy is in that conversation as well, uh, but she's also another player whom they can use on the wing, uh, who's got a little bit of positional flexibility there. Um, but but Bedford now is is in it where I, I don't think she was before. Exactly, and and you know this is a deep and talented Thorns team, so being able to find yourself in a regular role like that is a testament to, to the work that she put in and not you know, to do too much of a callback to prior episodes, but they got to get the midfield, right? They've they do. got to get the midfield, right? Yeah. Uh, Rocky gonna, and, and sink are back in this, in this period. Yeah. Rocky and sink are back. And that was a big discussion point. Rocky that sink was... Moultrie, those people, we, we talked about that pretty extensively and, and those issues were exposed in some of those track meet matches that they had like in Orlando at Chicago. Um, it was, it was a little ugly and, and they have done some tactical shifting during this, this period um, to, to sort of alleviate those wide open spaces that they left poor Megan Klingenberg and Kelly Hubley and, and Emily Sam Mangus Coffey, and, who, who basically and Quica, was, yeah. was expected to cover the entirety of the, middle of the field at times. Yeah, Sam Coffey is a superhero, but she she Poor. does have li- limitations, <laughs> and not every not everybody not anybody can uh, can cover that much field. Um, I so, mean, nobody. You know. I there there are very few players in the world, maybe none, who can cover as much space as they are asking Sam Coffey to 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 account for. Oh, yeah. In 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 the way they were playing in the first half of the season, and and they've just got to get that right. Uh, they have to find that balance because it was just too open. And, you know, you when you're that open, you put just extreme pressure on uh, on your team in possession to make sure that they're not giving up the ball. And I don't think the timber, the Timbers, goodness gracious, the Thorns have been bad in, pres- in possession per se, but they haven't been, you know, 2008 Spanish national team good and that's how good you need to be if you want to play the way that they've been playing uh, and they haven't been that and they were getting eaten up and they were leaving Sam Coffey and 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 Kelly Hubley and and, and Megan Glingenberg and 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 everybody in that back five they were la- leaving those folks on an island in those moments uh, being exploited by players like Caroline who may or may not be here this weekend we'll see yeah yeah, that that's a North Carolina team that, um, you know, was was kryptonite esque last time that uh, that the Thorns played them, and and was one of those teams that you're like, ooh, like that's that's a little sketchy if they get matched up in the playoffs, right? If if the Thorns were defending the way they were defending earlier in the season, I don't think they will be. Look, the 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 buy-in, the the stick tootiveness of this group, the togetherness of this group is, I think, something extremely special. I think that you know tactics and and coaching, you know, has, have come into question from people, but I I think that Mike Norris is somebody that has has buy-in from these players that you know the players trust and and they wanted to be the hire. You know, they they have stated publicly, and and. There, there just needed to be some some little shifts, and that happens every season. You know, Rean Wilkinson did the same things throughout last year. They had they had stretches of like, oh well, are they going to do it? Are they not going to do it? And then they did it, and they were dominant, and they were a bulldozer in the postseason. They they won a dramatic and exciting game against San Diego, and then they just blew the doors off KC in that final. And you're like, wow, this could be something special for years to come. This is where it happens. We've talked about it before. This is this is where it either is that or not. And with contracts expiring and potentially things shifting this way or that way, this is a a repeat would be amazing. It would be a a definer and and, uh, dynasty something. Yeah. It's a dynasty. It, it, it would be the four time champions in 11 years, most in the league by it would be two at that point now. So that that's, that's a tough number to catch. And and Um, that's what the thorns are, are chasing. Um, but I think you're spot on that, especially in club coaching and there there's, we've been talking a lot about national team coaching in the broader conversation, but in club coaching, solving problems over the course of a season is a huge part of a coach's job description because it's just a long season, right? And teams are good. There's talent everywhere. There are smart coaches everywhere. And you're going to have some things that get figured out over the course, uh, over the course of the season. And so being able to solve those problems is a, is a, you know, it might not be the top bullet. 
on on the job posting, but it's like one of the ones pretty shortly thereafter uh, of being able to solve those kinds of problems. And that's the task uh, before before Mike Norris now uh, of being able to to solve those problems and and to have them solved for the stretch run. That first game back is Sunday, 7.30 p.m. against North Carolina. One week later, they head to Washington for a game against the Spirit. Then on the road to Louisville, host O.L. Reign, host San Diego, host New Jersey, New York, Gotham, on the road at Angel City. Every single one of those teams, if you take a look at the NWSL standings, Save is in the, City, is, right? Save Angel City yeah. is in the top seven with the Thorns. That and it's a tight freaking table. We're talking twenty six points for North Carolina, twenty five for the Thorns, twenty five for Gotham, twenty four for OL Rain, twenty four for Washington Spirit, twenty one for San Diego, and nineteen for for Racing Louisville. Um, particularly and- that one through five, twenty six, twenty five, twenty five, twenty four, twenty four. That is no room for error territory and there always is an nwsl the parody is is you know tremendous you know there's a reason why last year's thorns team which can be described at times as dominant lost out on the shield race and on the final day of the season it's a tight table because the parody exists it's not a lot of teams and there's a lot of really good teams out there that could unseat the thorns but here's your difference between good and great is, and, is the and, ability to to power through those factors, and maybe not even just good and great, right? I mean, <laughs> as we just discussed, uh, the range of possibilities from uh, from this season go from literally establishing a dynasty on one end to completely missing the playoffs and having enormous questions going forward on the other end. So buckle your yeah. There folks. there is like. There is serious math that exists where the Thorns could miss the postseason. Th- and aren't... those are all realistic possibilities. We're not talking yeah. about far-fetched on either end. Those are all well within the realm of reality. Uh, so, And that's all going to be decided over the course of the next couple of months. So, yeah, fasten your seatbelts. It's going to be a ride. Buckle in. 15 games down, 7 to go. NWSL season's always got the chaos. It's always fun. Um, and I'm excited to to not just watch what happens with the Thorns, but with everybody else. There's always some some drama, some craziness, uh, and, and the NWSL never really fails to deliver on that front. So um, Challenge Cup is, is going to wrap up for, for the four teams that advance, but otherwise all eyes on the regular season, particularly for the Thorns as they seek to repeat as champs. That'll wrap it up for us this week on Soccer Made in Portland. Tune in early next week. We're going to have a special guest. Speaking of the Thorns, Janine Becky, Canada national team star, uh, you know, Portland Thorns winger and somebody who has proven herself to be a, a really talented soccer analyst as well uh, through her work with TSN uh, and other appearances on podcasts. And that'll on make TV. one of us on this podcast. Yes. Yeah. That'll, that'll make one of the three of us with, uh, with serious chops in that regard. Uh, really excited to bring Janine on. Uh, she'll be on with us on Tuesday. So keep an eye out for that pod either that night or, or Wednesday morning. Um, follow us on Twitter at soccer maiden PDX at Ryan T Clark at Chris Reifer. The, the platform's called X now, but I'm going to keep calling it Twitter. Uh, <laughs> subscribe to us wherever you get your podcasts. Um, you know, leave us a review if you so choose. Got any questions for Janine Becky? We will be posting an opportunity to uh, to ask those somewhere on X or, or elsewhere. But either way, looking forward to Tuesday. We will see you then.